I just want to talk to you about this issue because it's facing our community. And I want you to write two things down. Game and chance. Game and a chance. I want you to write this down. Life is not a game. What did I say? Life is not a game. Now this is a very important principle. I think you would agree with me that life is not a game. Do we all agree? I mean, your life is a serious thing. It's not a game. So you don't play with your life. So I'm just going to make some statements and you can deal with them yourself. First of all, laws are never created to accommodate vices, but to stop them. I repeat, laws are not created to accommodate vices but to stop them. Vices usually pre-exist law. The Ten Commandments were not given until almost 3,000 years after man sinned. I repeat, the Ten Commandments were not given until over 3,000 years after man sinned. So law is not created to necessarily stop man from sinning or getting involved in destructive vices. Laws are created so that man can recognize the vice. The principle of law is when a law is created, conscience comes alive. So where there's no law, there's no conscience. The Bible is very clear that when the law arrived, sin came alive. Which means you don't know wrong until right is defined. Why does God tell the children of Israel... Thou shalt worship no other gods before me. Because they were doing it. Why did God say, Thou shalt not make every graven image and bow down to worship it? Because they were doing it already. Why does God say, Thou shalt not commit adultery? Because they were doing it already. So what laws are for, they are not to accommodate vices or to dignify them or to sanctify them or even to affirm them. Laws are supposed to stop the proliferation of a vice. In Colorado this past week, the people voted for the legalization of marijuana as a medicinal alternative. So they voted 
And I think it might be important for our country to study Colorado right now. Because last Tuesday, they voted to legalize marijuana. Just a few days ago. The last four days, they've been trying to figure out how we can manage that. How are we going to police that? How we are going to regulate it? In other words, they made a decision before studying the consequences. Now let me just say this right off and put the camera on me. Marijuana is good. God created the bush. And God said in Genesis, everything he made is good. And everybody in this room takes drugs. But there's such a thing as abnormal use. The word is abuse. The reason why we use the term abuse is because there is a use for everything. Including games. So now the governor of Colorado, who voted against it, he said the day before yesterday, the people want it, now we got to figure out how to do this. And they are nervous. So I want to make this clear. My first statement I want you to remember. Laws are not created to accommodate a vice. They are created to stop them or to define them. Whether they are right or wrong, good or bad, healthy or destructive. A law brings definition. Number two, consequences are more important than decisions. What did I say? Please write that down. Keep that until you die. Don't ever make a decision more important than a consequence. Because decisions give birth to consequences. People normally say, if you make a decision, you got to live with it. That is not true. You don't live with the decision because that happens in one moment. You live with the consequences. So what you must do before you make any decision in life, is don't study the decision. Make sure you exhaust every possible means to study the consequences. Do your research, get information, check all the alternatives, study the options, find out historical data, Check those who already made that decision and read their life, study their life, find out everything before you make a decision. So my question is, is it lawful to ask someone to make a decision without all the information as much as possible about the consequences? In my view, this is illegal and irresponsible. I want to caution my words for myself. I am not against decisions. But I am against you asking me to make it 
without giving me the information. Not just about the decision, but the consequences. And I mean, give me real information so I could be responsible and objective. Here's why. Once you have decided that you can live with consequences, decisions are easy. So I think, nationally speaking, we are irresponsible at the moment in asking people who understand nothing about the consequences to make a decision. I therefore repeat my recommendation. We need to postpone and delay until the people have all the decisions and the consequences. Number three. It is irresponsible for leaders to transfer the burden of decisions to the followers that they are supposed to make. I'm going to repeat this. This is very important. It is irresponsible for leaders to transfer the burden of a decision to the followers that the leaders or the leader should make. It's like me being a parent and telling the kids, how should I run the house? It doesn't work that way. Bahamas Faith Ministries, an international third world leadership association, and a Twiler, and ILTI, and MMI, and DDIC, and all of our companies, I'm the guy at the top. I will listen to advice. I will seek the wisdom of collective knowledge. I will listen to all sides, but in the end, I have to take the responsibility for all decisions in this organization. You know it's interesting that Adam never picked a fruit. <laughs> Adam never gave anyone a fruit. Adam never made anyone eat a fruit. And yet, when everything was over, God went directly to him. See, if I want to blame you for what happens, all I have to do is let you make the decision. Just in case things don't work out, I could always say, you decided that. That is not leadership, that is irresponsible ability as a leader. Listen. We need leaders who are bold enough either to implement the law Apply the law, impose the law, or make a decision themselves to take responsibility for not applying the law. We have a number of people here who are lawyers. They are justices sitting in this room. They understand exactly what I'm talking about. Number four, write this down, chance is a game to the wealthy, but 
It is a source of hope to the poor. Can I say it again? This is very important. Chance is a game to the wealthy. They can afford to play it. But chance is a source of hope to the poor. They expect to live on it. This is dangerous. See, if I have a lot of wealth, I don't mind playing a game. Because if I lose, doesn't matter. This is why to the wealthy, it's a game. But to the poor, it's a life. And if something becomes your source of life, then you are a victim of chance. So your life is a game. We need to decide whether we want that culture. There is a very thin line between entertainment and habit. And sometimes we don't know when we cross it. I can go to a casino, I got three billion dollars, it's a game. If I lose a million, hey, no problem. If I have a salary with five children and I go to the casino, somehow I think that because I sit next to the guy with a billion, we are equal in the same casino. Life don't work that way. He lose a million, he got 299 billion million left. You lose your 200. You got five mouths that need to be fed. Rent to pay. And car to put fuel in. Don't mind this guy. He, that's entertainment for him. There's a line between you. This can become your source of life. What do you do when you have to establish another ministry in a country to deal with those who have a habit that is destroying their families and you got to take the money that you gain from one side to service the rehabilitation of people on the other side. Let's just think about the consequences. That's all I'm saying. I'm not against chance, but just make sure it's a game. I'm getting deep here. Chance is okay. If you buy a raffle ticket because you need a car, that ain't no game. <laughs> but if you buy a raffle ticket because you already have a car, you don't care if you win or not, that's a game. Am I clear? So when you wake up first thing in the morning, and the first thing you think about is chance, that's not a game. And some of you in this room are victims. And that's why you can't enter the kingdom properly. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes. 
Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You could play games. Are you matured enough to make sure it remains a game? If you need chance to live, it will destroy you. What did I say? Write that down, please. If you need chance in order to live, it will destroy you. I repeat, I'm not against games. Because you can play them anyhow. I just want you to understand. You must make sure it remains a game. Let me tell you when something changes from a game. To a habit. It's when you start misappropriating funds. In your personal budget. Oh that's too deep. Okay let me break it down. You have a light bill to pay. And you're choosing between the light and the game. You got a problem. Nothing wrong with the game. But when you start stealing from Paul, because Peter is a game, then Mary going to complain, and Susie and Johnny... And Bartholomew can be destroyed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Number five. If we're going to play the game, then this is my recommendation. That the powers who have been given responsibility to lead the country should oversee the practice and take full responsibility for all the consequences of the practice. Let me repeat myself. If we're going to play the game, it shouldn't be left up to a few groups of people who have their own private ambitions, the government itself should take responsibility, oversee the practice, and take full responsibility for all the consequences of that decision. In other words, the state should run it. That means if anything goes wrong, you don't blame me. You blame the state. Because whatever the state does, it can undo. Number six. This one is the most serious to me. Personal sin and transgression is not national sin and transgression. Please write that down. I want to to give you a principle to remember. The creator, from studying history, he has an amazing way to relate to mankind. And it's consistent. He judges humans based on the level of their vices. If you sin personally, he will judge you personally. So keep it personal. And then all of us are safe. 
In other words, if you stay in the closet, then there's closet judgment. So we still safe. Long as you stay in the closet. Whatever you're doing, keep it in your private closet. And then you and God deal with that privately. Is it clear? That's how God judges. He judges you based on the level of your vice. But there's a problem. When you take your personal sin and promote it to become community sin, that means to make it acceptable in the community, now God has to judge the community. And if you take a community vice that everybody, you know, do it in the community, and you decide to make it constitutionally acceptable, which means you're making it a national legal activity. Now, God is no longer judging the closet nor the community. He has to judge the nation. And you live in that nation. So you have a decision to make. It doesn't matter what people are doing privately. You need to decide to decide whether you want that to be nationally instituted. And now we have a national judgment. Many countries, South Africa, passed a law. And they took homosexuality out of the closet. You know, and they make it a national law. America, slowly moving that direction, taking the closet, turning it into a country. The Bahamas is where I live. And I got a house here. And my children, you know, they live here, they're born here. And my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren will live here, God willing. So, I need to decide what kind of judgment I want on my country. Listen, don't get me wrong. I am a nice guy. If you want to get involved in a behavior that I don't agree with, I got no problem with it, you know. Just keep it in your closet, that's all. Don't try to put up signs all over the island to try and convince me to accept your private activity as a public and national legal activity. This is... You know all the dope dealers in your neighborhood. You know them. But tell them keep it in their house. So we need to decide what kind of judgment we want. That's all. It's not complicated. Private sin, private judgment. Community sin, community judgment. State sin, state judgment. Nation sin, nation judgment. As big as you want to go. You know, the practice of homosexuality, for example, was always in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I want all of you who are practicing homosexuality to to understand that you are nothing new. You are boring. Don't walk around as if you got some new cause. It's as old as Sodom. No trophies for you. You are old. But if you read the text carefully, it says that it became acceptable in the country to the point where anyone who entered the country was attacked. God says, you know... I can't judge individuals anymore.
You wonder why some countries are now history? You got to find them in the dust. Do you know why Rome, when I went to visit Rome, I had to walk on broken rocks. The greatest empire in history was nothing but broken rocks. No army never defeated Rome. Rome was defeated by immorality. The Bible says the nations imagine vain things and he who sits in heaven laughs. In other words, God is watching you on the 30 December. God watching God. God said, let me just watch this. Let me see if you think you sharp. And then 10 years later, I'm going to laugh at you. Because your grandchildren will be in a habit. Number seven. Principles are more important than prosperity. What did I say? You know, we, 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 we talk about money. We talk about, you know, how you can profit from something. We talk about how you can gain from something. Listen, ask the dope dealer man. It works. Sure it works. You can get money from anything. Ask the prostitute. Prosperity can come through millions of types of activities. So don't talk to me about how much money you're making if you're selling dope to kids in school and destroying them. It's not the money, it's the principle. If you use destructive measures... To pay bills. Or to generate revenue. You are a party to destroying your brothers. Don't be swayed by 40 extra million dollars. That's an insult to me. There's enough brains in this room that can develop some projects to bring in $400 million a month. We don't need to succumb to other people's vices and sacrifice the principles of decency and ethics and hard work and honest labor for $40 million. You decide. Some of you in this room have to think about this. Uh, I can't stop you from doing something personally. But please don't put it on me publicly. Number eight, all laws produce culture. What did I say? Please write that down. Every law created in every country will eventually produce a culture. Culture comes from laws. This is why when God was about to create the nation of Israel, The first thing he gave them was not power, not money, not even an economy. He gave them law. Because he knew that they came out of a history of slavery and oppression where they had been adjusted to certain cultural norms. By the way, uh, can I say... Many of you may have remembered my teachings on law, but the word law in the Hebrew is it's from it's one of the words in translated is the word nomas, N O M E A S, nomas. It actually means normal. Law is that which accepts something as being normal now. 
it becomes what we call the norm. That's where the word comes from. So in Amsterdam, my friends here from Amsterdam will tell you that prostitution is a norm. Now you got to decide whether you want that to be normal in your country. So they passed a law. So they could decriminalize prostitution. One night we went driving in the Amsterdam, Amsterdam red light district. And around 1 a.m. the whole place came alive. What astounded me was there were so many young kids. Naked women in the windows showing all their bodies, selling themselves. And you just kind of walk past and pick the one you want. And it's all legal. And you get kids. How do you regulate kids? They've also legalized in Amsterdam marijuana. So they got shops, you know, where they sell it, which is what the direction Colorado's going in. And the man I was talking to in Amsterdam, he runs a rehabilitation center for hundreds of kids. And he said the greatest disturbance he has is that most of the kids that come there for help are like 13, 14 years old. And they're already strung out. They ain't got no future. They don't go to school. They just smoke dope. Is that what you want for your future as a country? See, you, we need to do some studies. Study those places. How come no one has shown us a study from Amsterdam of what legalized lottery is doing to their people? I mean, you know... Don't just talk about the money you're getting. Talk about how you spend it back on rehabilitation. You are a smart person. You got a brain with 500 billion cells. You, you are intelligent. Don't just make decisions. Study consequences. You know why I never had sex before I was married? Here's why. I study consequences. I saw my friends who had to drop out of school. I saw my dreams going up in smoke. If I had a baby with a woman. I saw the complications of this woman calling me for the rest of my life. Oh no, I studied the whole thing. And when that girl opened her leg, I ran. I said, you know something? I'm out of here. Oh yeah, a few of them did. You know, I was famous, you know, in the Bahamas. You all know that. I was you know, a musician. And man, they used to flock around us. I said, you know something? I, I, the, the consequences was clear in my head. The most important consequence is this one. Write this down, young people. You want to enjoy your memories. The problem with life is your memories never go away. So decide every day, do I want to remember this? Will I enjoy remembering this? That's called consequences. When you live right, you enjoy your memories. Yeah. And some of you ain't clapping, I understand. I really do. I appreciate that. That's why God gave me to you as a father now to tell you, okay, from this point on, get it right. Clap. Amen. Amen. So you must remember that all laws produce culture. You ain't going in no boot to mark no X, you know. You go in there to create the future culture of a country. Remember that. Do I want this as a culture? A teacher bought me a book, a, a textbook from a school 
some time ago. And that teacher is in this church. She, she bought me this book that this teacher from another country bought with them. And they were, you know, a foreign teacher in the Bahamas. And they bought this textbook for kids from age 5 to 11. That was the age group of the book. And she showed me. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it myself. They showed chapters in the book. It was a book on uh, uh, social, yeah, social science or something. And they showed these two men kissing in the book. Little drawings, you know. Five-year-old to 11-year-olds. And they were showing you two women getting married in a married dress. Now listen, you know, I ain't got no problem with that. But when you start teaching it, to a five-year-old, that is child abuse. You are imposing on that child your lifestyle before that child has the ability to determine what is right or wrong to compare that with any other consequences. Plus, you don't show the child any consequences. You should always put on the bottom of any statement in, relative, in relationship to that kind of behavior, that lifestyle, always put on the bottom, uh, by the way, you cannot pr- reproduce. I mean, you know, we do it all the time, don't we? <laughs> Number 10. Number 9. Check and see if you're listening. Number 9. This is very important. Vote your conscience. Always vote in life with your conscience. Not with a group. Because you don't sleep with a group. You sleep with your conscience. It never leaves you. Now let me define conscience for those of you who are in the kingdom. Holy Ghost. Can I say it again? You're getting deep on me. What is your conscience? Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost ain't stupid. If you ignore your conscience, you live in guilt. Guilt is a heavy burden. It causes cancer. Vote your conscience. I'm going to give you the last one. Don't move until you know the effects. Don't move until you know the effects. What did I say? Yeah, got no effects. You know, there's one good thing I can say about the United States uh, Health Department. The Federal Health Department. I like these people, at least from this perspective. Have you ever watched on television, they advertise a product? And they say, this product will take away your pain, solve your high blood pressure, cause you to be sexually potent, It will solve your migraines. This will solve all your problems. However, now you see, that's what I like with them. See, they they say, now however, your pain will go away, but you might commit suicide. (laughs) Let me come down here and talk about this for a second. I like these people. They say, you may have thoughts of jumping off a building. You will run to the bathroom 20 times. Your belly will grow. Your eyes will drop out in two months. Your teeth will become weak. Your tongue will turn blue. And you think your wife is your enemy. Now take the pill. These are honest people. 
Why don't our governments be like that? Tell us everything. Tell us the effects first. So that when we buy the pill, we are responsible. This is our problem. Don't just sell me the pill and tell me how it's going to help me. Include how it's going to kill me. You remember cigarettes? The whole fiasco with cigarettes, yes? Tobacco? Yeah. Everybody enjoying tobacco because no one telling them.